All right, this is Intro to Defocus, part three of our series, moving up to our PG Bokeh, which we're going to get to. And we're going to cover a lot of things in here. Some of these topics are discussed by different people. Um, I have a link at the bottom. Uh, some of this stuff was discussed by uh, Seneca VFX. Uh, has an awesome tutorial on there. And uh, later on in the next lesson, we're going to get into uh, edge extending uh, and also finally getting into PG Bokeh. Um, just so everyone's kind of like familiar with it. Again, I would say the, uh, the guy who really helped us in regards to uh, defocus uh, is obviously Hugo, Hugo Guerra um, of Hugo's Desk. So I'm going to have links at the bottom for all these other things you could look at. I'm here to help everybody kind of move along and make it a little bit more clear. And that's usually what I, I would love to do is I'd love to take all the tutorials on major websites and redo them. Um, just because some people, even though they're incredible artists, they're not the greatest teachers. And I'm sure they would admit that. And just to speed things up and get things going and make it easier for people to understand, that's the gift that's been given to me. So, and I'm not saying I'm the greatest, you know, teacher in the world here, but I'm just saying it does help to kind of have someone clearly kind of show you this stuff. So anyway, you can download this uh, folder, uh, Depth of Field, P3 Start, and all these files should line up. I have the... Uh, atypical just uh, root routing here so uh, there's a folder within a folder so you don't have to repath files or anything like that so let's start with the image that we have here and this is a shot of uh, I believe Hong Kong and you can see that it's just uh, got a, a bunch of very tiny little lights in the mix of this now this is again a normalized image so if I were to come over here and sample this white area you can see the value is very close to one um, you know, and also it's important to understand that I have auto alpha on so that you can see that I have alpha available here. So we have a lot of little tiny dots that can very easily uh, turn into some nice uh, nighttime bokeh. Um, so we'll talk about that again. You see, you get to you see the prominent bokeh, uh, you know, circles with night shots where there's a heavy contrast between light and darkness and small little dots and so forth versus what you would see in a broad daylight shot. Um, you still can do it in daytime, but you just it's just something that kind of comes with the, the territory when you obviously uh, open up really, you know, because you're at nighttime. Uh, it's just a common reality. So defocus. Defocus is a, is a common node that everyone is aware of. Um, I'm going to put my properties into one here. And defocus is just really simple. Uh, it's, it's not like your atypical blur as we talked about before. So, again, if we just take a blur... Uh, a big no-no in this industry is trying to just use the blur node for depth of field because if you just do blur you're using a Gaussian based sampling and you're not getting you're getting like a squarish format here uh, you can also go you know these other different filter types but you're going to basically get a square shape whereas uh, photographically you should be getting the circles of confusion bokeh so that goes with defocus so if we go to defocus we get these nice circles but again, we don't get to define the circles. We don't have to, you know, if we're trying to make these look more like anamorphic, your job is to actually know what sort of artifacts the camera you shot in actually uh, emulates. There are almost, there's so many different types of flavors of lenses that give different bokeh. Uh, there's like a Jupiter lenses and so forth, and they always give a really weird looking bokeh. People are always trying to get that uh, iconic 80s or, you know, some kind of like weird artifact that, you know, from imperfect lenses made way back in the day and you have to emulate those those artifacts um, so just be aware of that so defocus you also have aspect ratio you do get a chance to change it up if you want to get a little bit more anamorphic feel which is the oval bokeh and then you got the scale you can see it kind of scale it up and crazy so there's some really nice options here for very fast workflows and it's a very computationally uh, not that expensive file to uh, get into so moving on, we got the Convulse Bokeh. And again, a big thanks to uh, Seneca VFX. Again, look at the link below. Uh, he goes into heavy, heavy discussion um, on uh, this. So go ahead and talk about it a little bit. Here we have the city again. And in this case, I'm reformatting, reformatting it for speed to uh, down to 1920 by 1080. And then I'm putting a keyer in here. Uh, so if you see if I uh, look at my alpha channel, you can see I basically isolated all the little bright dots here or the values that are, you know, um, anything. You can see it's like anything that's higher than, you know, 0.62. Uh, it's basically getting keyed into here based on luminance. And then from there, I can use that as a grade node. 
And if you can see the grade now, it's plugged in through the alpha information. So taking the alpha uh, luminance is basically re recreating uh, or re you know, basically rebuilding the alpha channel. So if I look at the alpha channel, this is the alpha channel we're going to use as a mask. The white areas will be color corrected. The black areas will be left alone. So if I come over here and take the uh, grading of this, which you can see here, and up this value, you'll see the values now uh, are going to be very, very high versus what they were, befo but were before. So if I come over here and sample that, we got values that are above 1, so above the normalized range of 0 to 1, and that's going to really emphasize sort of a bloomed out bokeh. Now, Convolve is, again, Convolve is basically a uh, broken down... Um, rudimentary defocus, a Z defocus node. So it allows you to bring in and uh, build up the shape of what you want your bokeh to look like. And that's why it has a filter input. So the filter input is basically the, the, the circular shape that you want to build, very low res, okay, and then you plug it in. And then the image just comes in. So here we have Convolve. There's not many options for this, obviously, and a lot of the things you would control to ch change the shape would be the grade node, and then the size of the actual uh, node here with a reformat node set to scale. So here we have just a simple constant that's black, and the value of the constant set to 255 by 255, and then we have a flare. Now the flare you have to make a couple adjustments to. Uh, you can change the number of corners if you wish. Uh, you can actually, you'll have to come in here and change the inner color to fill it in, because if you don't, you get an empty space in there. Um, and you also want to take the sharpness up uh, extremely high here. So you see corner sharpness is n at 99. Uh, so you get a nice sharp, basically, you know, shape. So, and the reformat node is, you can see, if I leave it to scale, as I bring the scale up and down, we can bring the scale that's basically in size per pixel to match our actual image. So we, we will need to adjust this as we kind of go through to change the size. So let's go to the convolve now, and now you can see what we're getting. And again, if I take the scale, okay, here's the scale right here, and just start playing with it, you can see if uh, per pixel in comparison to the pixel size of this entire image here, um, we're starting to get, this, we're defining the shape, basically. And then the luminance brightness, we can go back to the grade node here, and we could start playing with, you know, the waypoint or something, you know, and just to kind of like bring down the brightness, all right. So again, it gives you a nice bokeh photographic feel through the process. All right, so now we're going to get into the ZD focus node. Um, this right here, if we go ahead and take a look, we have the image here. And we I'm just reformatting it again to 1920 by 1080. And this is simply a copy and paste of our created flare over here. So here's the shape itself in a square format, 255 by 255. And this also has a filter input. So let's go ahead and just take this here and ZD focus. And it's important to understand, again, that this read node is set to auto alpha, so that there is a physical alpha in there. And then if we come over here, this ZD focus node, you can see that we have the basic setups here. We have the size and the maximum. We're going to be talking about this more in depth in the next tutorial. Um, but basically, the size is the size of the blur, and then the, the fall-off gradient only maximizes to a specific size. Um, so we'll talk about that. But in this case, in this particular case, the size doesn't really matter. So you can see if I come in here and I adjust the size, you're seeing nothing is changing. See that? What is going to matter is maximum. Maximum is going to choose the maximum blur of this. So this is a default, this is one of those things where you're really defocusing a flat background out of focus uh, in one general blur, um, very quick and dirty and so forth. Um, so again, you can see, if I come over here, I have the filter type plugged into the image. We can cho choose disk, we can choose bladed, and these are the different choices we have. So if I want to have, in this case, if I don't want to have five blades, I can have six blades, seven blades, three blades, you know, whatever you want. Um, usually want to go at least five, um, but you can go like six in this case. And then of course you do have aspect ratio, so if you want to make it more like a uh, anamorphic lens, you can do that. And then of course you have the roundness, which you can round it up a little bit, or you can ro rotate it if you wish. The inner size, you're going to see like a transparency issue there. Inner feather, so you got a feathering of that inner circle. You've, there are bokehs where the center is a little bit semi-transparent inner brightness. You can see you can start to get <laughs> weird shapes there. 
These are all things trying to mimic what you would commonly see in, in a, a typical all types of different lenses across the world. Um, so again, we have that. We have disc. Go back to disc. And disc only has filter shape and aspect ratio. So again, you could choose anamorphic. Uh, you could choose the shape itself. Make it smaller and more filled in, tinier. Um, so yeah. Um, but the big thing we're doing is choosing to use the input image, which comes through filter. So filter, I'm again bringing in my typical shape, which if I back up, there it is. So again, with the flare, you can see if I, I come over here to the ZD focus and I come to the flare, I start playing with the inner color, you'll see that it's going to change. Now, when it comes to color, the color of what your input filter image is, is going to be black and white. The ZD focus node is going to be set to filter channel red. If it's set to none, you're not going to see anything. But red is red, green, or blue. So R, G, and B. You can see I'm choosing them. And it's just a black and white information. If you were to come in here and make any changes to this image, like if I came over here and took the flare and changed the inner color to something like, you know, purple or something, it's not going to change. You're not going to see a purple center of your bokeh, okay, you will see a luminance difference because there's a different luminance difference here. But again, it's not going to change anything. It's going to it's it's going to be be based on almost like an alpha like image. It's using almost like an alpha image. In this case, we're using the information of the RGB information. So again, in this case, I could come over here and pull these all the way up back up to to white again because it doesn't matter. All right, so let's take a look at the ZD focus node. Again, we're going to get into all this information here, but as of right now, this is a real quick way and probably the most uh, useful way to build up just a background that's out of focus. You're not worried about the fall off of the depth of field uh, and, you know, and so forth, and there's not a heavy rack focus concentration of objects in the foreground and to the mid-ground to the background. So with that said, you can see we have the maximum. That's the only thing that you need really to control. Um... There is uh, an idea of the amount of samples, but we're going to talk about that because it has to do with the changing of the, the actual uh, intensity of the circles of confusion or depth of field or shallow depth of field transitioning from the uh, areas that have depth of field or in focus. So, um, And then we've got a whole bunch of other things in here. You can do some filtering. You can see filtering is cubic, keys. Uh, you can do Mitchell. Um, and then you can also clamp the image filter itself, so the image coming in doesn't have values above uh, 1 or below 0, um, and so forth. Uh, you do have the option for gamma correct here, which uh, will allow for sort of like a more intense intensity here. And you can also turn on bloom, which opens up these options here. And the bloom threshold, again, is based on the threshold of the value. So if I go back to the original image here, we can see that this value right here is a value of 0.97. So I could put this to 0.9, and only these areas will actually get the extra bloom. So anything of this value or higher will get the bloom. So now if I go ahead and go back to the ZD focus node, you can see if I turn the bloom off and on, these areas are getting a nice bloom. But other areas, which if we kind of say like this area here is a value of like 0.89 and 0.8, you're probably not going to see a lot of bloom, a lot of blooming in that area. So if I turn this blooming off and on, you can see there's a little bit of going on because there is a value a little bit going over 0.9, but it's a little bit there. So this is really just isolating the bloom to those really intense lights, like this light, this light, this light, this light, this light. So again, you can see I can continue to kind of call the threshold here of the bloom, and only those really, really bright lights are getting the bloom. And then of course gamma correct. Gamma correct is a little uh, to me is a little bit too much because it, it, it's it's really brightening up everything and there's really no control for it, which I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of. But anyway. All right, so moving on, uh, we're going to get into all of these crazy uh, options as we get into 3D. So this is uh, just a typical scene I created inside of Nuke. So I have just the uh, actual city, you know, just using it. I made one version a little bit more greener. Put this on cubes. So you can see I put them in the cubes, just two cubes. I've got a, a, just basically a camera in there that's, um, you know, not a super, super long camera, just a 42 millimeter. Um, but it is what it is. And I'm using a scan line render to render the camera and the scene. 
So let me take a look at it. It renders this out. Now, anytime you render scanline render, it comes with a bunch of other goodies. It comes with depth, for one thing. It's important to note, as we kind of look at depth on here, depth is basically um, anti-aliased, or, uh, I'm sorry, aliased. It's not, it's, it's, there is no, like, transition between this area and this area. It's a solid value for depth for each pixel. However, if I go back to <coughs> my alpha, sorry, my RGBA, all right, and let's go back and just take a look. Let's find an area where I can physically see something, like right here. And I'll put my pixel value right, let's go like right here, right? Actually, it's, yeah, let's go like right here. Okay, so here's a value. And if I take a look at my depth, you can see we do have a value there. But there is a chance if I come to the scanline render and I take my samples, if you bring the samples down to one, it's not going to give you like a anti-aliasing of the actual RGB. But as I start to increase this, you'll start to see that transition value here. However, the difference that you might get from different other renders here is that you find, you go to the depth channel, that this actually still gives you a value for any pixel that is half transparent. Now, we're going to talk about uh, Hugo's wonderful um, technique um, that of just edge extending in case we get some errors. But it's important that every single pixel, whether or not it is transparent or not, has a solid, full, uh, non-anti-aliased uh, depth pixel above it. So if this pixel here <coughs> is um, specifically trans, uh, you know, we can't have a, a anti-aliased or sort of blurred sampled depth channels, okay? Um, but if we do have an RGB value that steps out here, we need a pixel there in the depth information that is, uh, again, alias, not, not anti-alias at all. So it's important to realize as we kind of go through this. And thankfully, Nuke has done that for us. I'm not saying it probably won't be perfect, but chances are you're probably going to still have to employ the uh, edge extend technique that uh, Hugo uh, shows in his uh, series. You uh, have to just be better. So anyway, um, let's keep going here. So this allows for me a 3D scene or a 3D render for me to actually play with the depth of field information. So if the camera would, I'm getting it's kind of bogged down here. Let's, see, let's go back to RGB. All right. So let's go to the D Z D focus node. And now you have a couple things that, these are kind of quirks that I'm a little bit never too thrilled about. I think I'm going to put my samples to one or two. For some reason, my computer's like lagging here. Um, but anyway, we have our point focus here. And if you ever have a hard time seeing this, you can always just, you know, gamma down or, you know, whatever. You can see, oh, look, there's a little point there. And that will dictate the actual uh, point, focal point in XY position. So if I put this over here, you'll see very quickly this will go into focus and this will go out of focus, okay? So that is basically the focal point, x, y is the position. The focal plane, we'll talk about this, the value of z that will be in focus, and that's established by the focal plane. So you'll see this update. As we do this, you'll see the focal plane data changes. See, as I kind of move this around. As the point changes, the focal plane changes, and that's all based on the z-depth data. Now, this is not a normalized from 0 to 1 normalization of the z-depth, and we can see that by uh, going into our depth channel here at the scanline render node, and you can see that we have values of uh, like 0.29. Let's see, they are relatively normalized, but they're very small values. They're even below normalized. So you can see the range we have is like 0.19 all the way up to 0.33. So it is normalized, but it's really a, a huge range between two very small numbers. Now we could we could read uh, adjust these via a grade node uh, to set a zero and one, but I'm not going to do that. But we are within a normalized value here. So let's go back into ZD focus. As I have before the filter type image, I have the filter plugged in. This is the same image we've been using over here. So let's go ahead and just start to play with these options looking at the RGB value. Now, this is where people kind of can get confused as regards to what, what's all this stuff all about. First off, the depth channel is the channel that it's feeding this information on. If you have the depth channel on another channel, you have to set it to this. But commonly, the depth Z is the channel that we're on. Now, the math uh, right now is set to far zero. If you kind of hover over this math, these are different types of uh, falloffs. Um, in regards to as things go in focus to out of focus. So you can try them out each differently, 
You can see they even recommend some of these here. Like it says that nuke would be the far equals zero, which is what we currently have in here. So when you're talking about nuke and using the scanline render, it's going to be far equals zero. All right. And if you're using render man, that's what you're going to use. You'll see Maya is far equals negative zero, which is sort of an inverse, uh, is negative one over the distance in Maya. And again, it depends on what is black and what is white. If the if it renders the black in front or the black behind, it's all based on when you render the Z depth in a 3D application, it's going to take a point and it's going to render that as far as the physical distance and whatever measurements you have in Maya, uh, usually centimeters, from camera. So as you get further and further away, uh, things will either get uh, very a lot darker or brighter. That's why you might have to just choose the inverse here. I'm going to show you a better way of kind of understanding all these in a second uh, in a demonstration because they do have different types of falloffs and they change as the as the values uh, go from the normalized zero to one. Okay, so we currently have the output set to result, which is what we're getting the resulted uh, depth of field as you know as this is the in focus area. And we, as we discussed in our first uh, lesson way back when, how there's different fall-offs in the way that the camera responds. But here is the thing to understand. This isn't really uh, respecting anything in the real world or even some of the tools we used in lesson one. It is you basically finagling and, and changing values, trying to emulate what you're seeing in your plate shot you really don't have a connection to a real camera reality or the there's no there's no calculation here that's taking in the sensor size taking in the, the 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 actual millimeter lens of the camera this is you just blurring and trying to get an accurate fall off uh, change comparable to what you're seeing in your actual plate shot so this is a lot of guesswork and that is one of the reasons why pg bokeh besides the edge work on PG Bokeh, where everyone's using PG Bokeh in the industry. Because this, this can be used, and as we have, we discussed with a lot of our guests that work at, you know, big studios, this is used a lot. This is ZD Focus node, so don't don't be like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I got to use PG Bokeh. Uh, it's not true, not all the time. Um, if you can get the results here, you can get the results here. Uh, so anyway, so this basically just puts what's in focus, and then we all have a fall off. And again, as I'll talk about later, this will change the fall off result. How fast does it fall off to the being out of focus? So again, that's going to play a big part. The depth of field, uh, we're going to switch now over to focal plane setup. And a lot of you guys have seen this where if we kind of take this, you can see the foreground out of focus is red. The actual depth of field or the area that's in focus or has a very comparably small circle of confusion uh, is the area that's in focus, which is established here with the depth of field. So if I want to have an area that's higher in depth of field, uh, obviously this in comparison to the real world would be if your f-stop, if you're if you're open wide, wide open, you're going to have a lot more shallower depth of field or a very narrow area of green that's in focus. So you would probably want to bring that down. Sorry, I was moving the focal plane. Focal plane, you can see I can actually change this. Um, but if I want to adjust to the focal point, again, I have to drag this. This thing always needs to be updated. So just realize that there are times where you might load up a different fall off. You'll still have to take this dot and physically move it, okay, which is kind of annoying. But it's not going to update until you physically come in here and update it. Otherwise, you can take the focal plane and move it around yourself, as you can see here. So the area in focus is green. The area out of focus foreground is red. And the area of out of focus uh, background is blue, okay. Uh, so the size of the blur, you're never going to see anything in this setup, focal plane setup. And this is a good startup, but it's never something you should really compare. You want to see the fall off and also the sampling. You want to go over here to layer setup. Now layer setup is interesting because it's automatically, as you can see here with this button, automatic layer spacing. It's trying to uh, have different like areas of the intensity of the blur. Now, if you you can see by just looking at the layers, and these are just different layers. If you don't have enough of these layers, the transition's going to be really harsh. And I'm going to demonstrate that by actually overriding the automatic layer space. And you can see if as I change this, it's updating here. And the computer is trying to figure out the best way to optimize basically in in layman's terms the sampling of the transitions here. So you can see back here, 
there's one, two, three, four, five different, uh, you know, areas that are going to be blurred. But if you don't have a lot of layers, as if I'll do here, I'll turn off automatic, and I'm going to take the layer depth down to something crazy small, like 11, this is going to be very crappy samples, okay? So, for instance, if I take a look at this with the final result, which we'll go back to result, you'll see, you're not going to see it here, I'm going to show it in a better example, but if I go back to, I'm going to have to find it here, it's kind of hard to see back the layer set up. So I know that that's the, that's the variation difference there, right? So you can kind of isolate these two. So you can see this line, this line. If I go back to result, you will, you won't see it here, but in further examples of ex uh, something extreme, you'll see that this area will be dramatically, there'll be just automatically an abrupt change and you might see some artifact lining here because it's taking like a intensity of blur, like maybe four here and then abruptly going to two, and then abruptly going to one. And that's something you're going to see later on. So long story short, if you're working on a professional movie, your chances are you're probably going to uh, really up the samples uh, manually. So again, if you come over here to uh, layer setup, and you can see we don't have a lot of samples, you can, if you leave this to automatic, it's going to figure it out the best it wants. But if you're doing a Hollywood movie, chances are you're going to have to come in here and do something insane like this. So you're going to have to really, really... Uh, and this stuff will take 20 years to render, obviously, but you get yourself a variation of the different blurs as they occur. There's not this dramatic change. <coughs> the layer curve, again, all you got to do is hover over these things or just click in here and actually see. It says apply to layers, zero gives evenly spaced layers. Increasing this value will be closer to the in-focus region. So what this does is you, you can see that you know, a, a value of like zero is going to give you evenly spaced samplings, but because of the uh, incredible amount of information of the actual dramatic contrast of shift of what's in focus to out of focus will be near where the depth of field lines are, which would be right here and right here, where we go, we're going from out of focus to in focus, you can take this and increase this, and you'll see that you're going you're to get more samples in that transitional area. You can see as I kind of push this forward, you're getting way more samples here, right, and over here, and then way more samples over here. Now this, the distance is pretty close, but anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this back to automatic layer spacing. Um, again, this is a great way to preview, but eventually if you're doing a Hollywood movie, you might want to make some adjustments here. That will be a little bit overkill, but they will render for you good stuff. All right, so let's jump over to... Uh, filter shape and again this just shows you the incoming filter shape that we created earlier that I plugged into filter again we have it set to image filter channel RGB or red and image filtering is set to qubit all right so let's go back to result and we'll talk about size and maximum so you can actually again like I said hover over these things the size size of the blur at infinite depth the blur near the camera than the focus plane may be larger. And then the maximum says the filter size is clipped at this value and thus nothing can be blurred any more than the maximum. So this sets the intensity of the blur fall off and then the maximum says you can't go any higher. There's sort of like a, uh, not necessarily linear, but more of a linear logarithmic fall off of the depth of field. But the maximum says at a certain point, we sort of take that sort of linear logarithmic fall off and we we just make it a constant. So it can only get so blurry at a certain uh, blur level. So you can kind of make some uh, choices here. And again, I'll take my focal plane and put it up here. Again, we're using depth Z. So I'm going to talk about the different formats. I'm sorry, uh, we're using, in this case, far zero. But I can use different fall offs, like I can choose direct and so forth. And you'll see the fall off is a lot different. And see if I can get this size up to 30 here. And let's make sure I have, am I looking through it? Yeah, okay. Let's go back to depth, sorry. So again, I'll change the focal plane here. I'll put it way up front here, and then we have this out of focus. And then you can see as I take the maximum and the size. So these two usually are right next to each other. And then you can do the maximum like this. So if we go like, we increase this, I'm sorry, size can usually be bigger than maximum, but then the maximum usually will be under the size. 
So even though the maximum blur is 100, and we can put this to 100, you can see it's maximum blur, the fall off of that blur we can kind of clamp and sort of bring um, a straight constant. So we can kind of limit that. Okay, now you might start to see artifacts along the edge. That is probably in regards to the fact that our edge is uh, okay, it, the, the, the difference between the RGBA and the aliased uh, depth channel. So we're going to get into that again in the next lesson. But again, I could come in here, take this focal plane, and set this back. You always want to take a look at these edges here, and you can always hit A for alpha to see the transition to see if you're getting any strange artifacts in here. So again, obviously, if I come in here and I'm focusing something way back here, you're taking a look, and if I disable, hit D to disable, you can see we're getting a blur, but we're still getting a very sharp line, like right here, right? Wouldn't this object be, to a certain degree, more blurred across here? See that? Whereas down here, actually let's go up, up here, we can see the transition there blending in, see that? Whereas when we get into this area, where two 3D objects are actually touching each other, that blur isn't, uh, I mean, it's there, but it's not as pronounced as up here, okay? So that's a common typical artifact that involves, and that's why some people will usually separate two, two different elements, um, and that's where deep information and all this other fun stuff of, of two different renders of uh, two different hero objects with their own z depth, which will actually play a part in not seeing these weird artifacts. And again, it's one of the reasons why people use PG Bokeh. So again, it's good for you to see these artifacts and go, why why use PG Bokeh? Why spend a hundred and some bucks to 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 buy that plugin and so forth? Um, because it's just what it is. Sometimes you just got to be as accurate to the plate as possible. In Hollywood, they are just like that. Or I hate to use the word Hollywood. Sorry. <laughs> In the industry, how about that? So ZD Focus Linear Example. This is where I want to help you guys kind of understand. I've taken a checkerboard image and inverted it. So again, I have these contrasty uh, white dot lines here. Um, and then over here, I have two different types of ramps. So this is a linear ramp, uh, which the values, if you go to the color value, I just have a point here and point here. You can see the different values here. This is a 1920 by 1080 image, and I've just basically created a linear this value, if I sample it, it goes from 0 to 1, and it's set to linear. You could have different falloffs here, P linear, smooth. Uh, again, these can you can use for advantage if you're kind of using it. And then the nonlinear, I'm going to take that, that's been assigned values from, in this case, 0 all the way up to 199. So in this case, you can see I've just made the color 200. 200. So it comes off visibly as we look at it is pure white, but if I kind of go across, the values are outside of the normalized range. Um, so I have currently this set to the normalized version, and this is going into a shuffle node, which is getting shuffled into the Z depth information. So if I take a look at my information here, I have my RGBA. And if I take a look at my depth channel, I have my depth channel here. Um, so that's going to be used to drive the ZD focus. The ZD focus is reading the depth channel, as you can see here. And now we're going to be able to take a look at the variations of the falloffs and so forth. So if I come over here to the result, uh, you can see I have the size set to 15, and we see the falloff occurring. We see that the circles of confusion or the bokeh are building up here. Um, I can plug in a filter and then set my filter to uh, image. And it goes black because I need to set my filter to either R, G, or B using the alpha or the luminance information. And now you can see it takes on the shape of my uh, shape here. So if I come back to my refocus node, and the scale of this doesn't really matter. Um, so if I take the reformat here and I bring the scale up for more resolution, uh, that'll probably give us a sharper shape. So again, you can see if I... Nothing's really going on at all. Um, but anyway, I can come over here and adjust my flare. I can change the uh, corners to four. So now I have four here, or f in this case, go back to five. And I also have the inner ring, which if I bring back, I'm going to get these, you know, like the little tiny holes. You see, that's the little shape that we're creating. All right, so let's go ahead and 
take a look again as we trans the, the transition is happening here from in focus dots to out of focus dots. Okay, so it's forming that shape of the bokeh that we have redefined here. And if we take a look, we'll jump over here to focal plane setup. This is pretty uh, explanatory. So I have the focal point set over here. I can change the focal point, but I want you to notice something as I change the math. So if I go from direct, I go from depth, look at the look at the actual in focus area. The actual depth of field has not changed. I, I, I have the size as is. But as we get here closer to camera, you know, you got to imagine that here's the camera recording, you know, facing this way, this way, and then there's a human being here and you're in focusing, and then over here is an, another person. Notice as I take the focal point and I bring it back, the depth of field increases. This is very uh, indicative of what you would see in the real world, as I discussed in lesson one, right? That as you get closer to camera, you get a very narrow, narrow shallow depth of field. And then here, as you get further away, you know, further to infinity, everything goes into focus. So this is a this is your option of um, this is an attempt to emulate, in a general way, the lenses that we have in the real world. Okay, so that the fall off can match without you having to do any math or anything like that, or actually plug in information about the camera as you would with PG Bokeh. All right, so we also got other ones here. So if we go to direct, direct is exactly you can see direct is an interesting reality here because it's uh, the focal plane of the depth of field is 0.91. Notice that it's almost a linear interpolation. So almost like 90% uh, it's going to be in focus. If I put this depth of field to 0.5, it has now taken up 50% of the scene. So if I put this over here, you can see it basically takes up about 50%. There is a transition, obviously, between the red and the blue. But you're getting you're getting more of a linear interpolation as a, as opposed to the logarithmic, you know, algorithm fall off whatever. Uh, when you go from direct to depth, so direct is literally what it is. If I want a linear interpretation, if I want to have this set to 0.25, I can do I can do that. Okay, so oops, I keep getting these numbers wrong. Depth of field 0.25. There we go. So now I have that interpolation. Now you can try these out in, independently. Some are the inverse. So the direct minus direct is going to change this up so that the out of focus, you know, obviously the out of focus was the red and the uh, uh, in focus, you know, they, they swap. So you can see there's a swap from direct to indirect. There's a swap from depth. Depth and negative depth is interesting because it doesn't do that. So again, if you want to learn the math of these, you can kind of look at them and it the negative depth is d negative distance in front of camera, whereas depth is Z direct control blur. So there is a big difference there. And then we have far, and we have this. Now these, again, we talked about far being more of a nuke interpolation, uh, which we can get into. But you can kind of take a look at these independently. And again, I'll just go back to my atypical depth for now. And that's going to give us a more reality of the fall off. Again, I can increase the depth of field, but... It's, you're going to get a narrower or shallower depth of field as you move closer to camera, okay, or as the values get closer to the value of zero. And as they get closer to the value of one, you get a more uh, pronounced depth of field or area in focus. So again, I wanted you guys to, that's going to help you guys kind of understand what the heck is going on with this node. Um, and it, it helps you just understand in general. So ZD focus image example. So this is where we actually bring in just a, an atypical image here. Now, I talked about, before I kind of cut off to that, the non-normalized version. You guys have seen this before. It's not rocket science. You just take a gray node and you set your black point and white point to the numbers that are the, the furthest distance and the normal distance. And then what you get is exactly what you should get, just like what is this version here. So if I compare the two, they should be exactly the same. So it's common that when you get your information from Maya, you have to find the dark furthest point and the closest point by sampling the actual RGBA value, which is best done by shuffling the actual footage into the RGB and sampling it with your atypical shift and control. Um, and then finding the, the furthest point and then backing each one of these up a little bit. And then that normalizes your image to everything is between zero and one. Okay. So ZD focus image input. So we have the image uh, again reformatted. We have the linear ramp coming in for our Z, uh, our depth of uh, field or depth information. Nothing different here. 
and then I'll just go ahead and just put this over here. So Z defocus image, and we have the option, as I talked about before, of gamma correction and bloom. Um, so again, it's the same thing. Um, I kind of discussed this earlier, so I'm kind of repeating myself. You do have gamma correction, which is this heavy intensity overall gamma change. And then I'll turn that off. But if you have bloom on, which gives access to these, you can choose what areas are going to be bloomed up. And then the intensity of that gain, you can see if I turn off and on, it is only going to bloom the areas that are above the value of 0.85. So, and again, you will not see that bloom, okay, unless the actual bokeh or out of focus occurs. So what it means is, you can see if I take this bloom here, you're not seeing much bloom occurring. And that's because it's only going to bloom the areas that are out of focus. And the more out of focus they are, the more this takes into effect. So very important. So again, if I take this Z defocus node, and let's see here, let's see if we can make a couple of adjustments here. And you can see the transition, things are going in focus. Right here, here's the in focus area, here's the out of focus. In fact, I can take the result here, put this back to focal plane setup, and I'll take the depth of field and decrease it. So only this area is in focus. This kind of doesn't defy uh, real world lensing, obviously, because these objects are all one distance from camera, yet I'm just basically having this sort of get blurry and focus and then blurry. So again, I'll put this back to result. And again, as I talked about before, the bloom will only occur in the areas that are physically getting put out of focus. See that? There's nothing going on with these points here because they are not changing. See that? And the same thing with the gamma. You can see the gamma control is only brightening up the areas that are transitioning or completely out of focus. There, you're not, you're seeing a little bit going on there, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, it's, I'm not a fan of this gamma correction tool. Um, but anyway, um, you do have a mask input, which is good uh, for this. So that's another thing you can kind of play into the part of this. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it, folks. And again, we're going to get into uh, the next lessons, which will be how to really deal with such like stuff like fur and uh, stuff that's really tricky around the edges. And that's how we move towards PG bokeh. So I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Again, you can download this off of my website for free. And again, please uh, give subscriptions and links to Seneca VFX at the bottom, as uh, he definitely helped uh, in regards to this area here, kind of understanding. And that's pretty much it. See you later.